that comes up today. There was social history. That's a sure cause of the um, year. I think that's fine because okay. that way at least if you stay there you can see them sitting, right? We <laughs> don't have to stay there either. <laughs> yeah, it would be nice to get closer. Um, we'll see the colors show up. Uh, that is <laughs> fine with me. I'm at Empire State. Uh, I've been there for, it's my fifth year. It's my fifth year. Yeah. And is, it's part of the, is it part of the CUNY system? It's part of the SUNY. It's part of SUNY. SUNY. Yes. SUNY. So it's, okay. a, it's, a, it's a statewide SUNY college. Uh, 
It is very complicated. Everyone always says, where is it? They say, well, we have 36 locations around the state. And they say, I know there are lots of SUNY colleges. Where's yours? And I say, there's 36, 36 locations around the state. I had exactly this conversation this morning. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is a college that requires a lot of explanation. Uh, yeah. Leo, there. But you're obviously colleagues. not at 36 locations around the no, state. No, I am in Brooklyn. <laughs> I am in downtown Brooklyn, next to the okay. Macy's. Um, and uh, yes. So, in fact, only for another few months. I'm about to. I am taking a job at NYU oh, in the nice. in the fall. Great. So, fantastic! Congratulations. Thank you. Uh, you going to stay in Brooklyn though? Well, you're it's a, living. That is a, it's an excellent <laughs> question because we're in New Haven now, and we, we are we are debating uh, where we are, what we are going to do, yeah. where we are going to live. Right. Um, I get can, the job that I want. Then. Yeah, exactly. So you just have a little bit of a commute. Yeah. <laughs> just, just a little bit. Not bad. How we thought that I was taking a job in Maryland, and so we negotiated a commuting budget from NYU that was based on a three-hour commute. Yeah. And so he has an enormous commuting <laughs> so budget. I, so I can wow. go on. So I can go on Amtrak if I you want. You can have yeah. all these sellers. That would be really nice. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah, that would make a very nice Your commute. Your commuting budget is larger than many graduate students. <laughs> You'd probably take the train and then take a cab over to like you. <laughs> exactly. Um, the problem was he didn't negotiate at any other points. That's not true. <laughs> oh, I guess still you you were more focused. Yes, on the I was negotiating on the commuting because that's what I thought. Because you thought right, right, right. Yeah, but that's a long. What is the new job situation? Uh, so it's at Gallatin, which is NYU's um, college for self for movie stars and self designed majors. Um, <laughs> And I did a gals in class when I was an NYU student, and it was like, they were irritated with me because I wrote a pile of paper, and I didn't do like. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I will be making them. It was a summer course, and I was one of the few grad students. It was like grad and undergrad, okay. and I did this like very serious research paper literally in this class, and they like, were like, the made like a collage. Right. The professor was like fawning over it, and I was like. <laughs> 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 well, I will be making all my students write final papers. <laughs> no colleges. Yeah, yeah. So I'm moving there in the fall. Like moving, moving. Like moving, moving. Like leaving Empire State. Wait, have you not heard this? No. I thought everyone, I thought everyone knew this at this point. Oh my yeah. God. Congratulations. Sorry. Thank you. Is it tenure track? No, it's a clinical line. So it's it's long term contracts and promotion ability, but no, um, but no tenure. Awesome. That's true of all of Gallatin, isn't it? It's true people. for a lot of Gallatin, but not all of it. The Draper program is um, like that too. Yes. Yeah. Master's program. Yeah. Oh, so it's they so. They usually continue folks there. Yes. Yeah. I was told that no one has ever not been renewed. And there's research support. And there's research support. Mm -hmm. And it's a two-two load, and it, um, and with like. And it's NYU. Yeah, That's exactly. Right. And it's NYU. So you got all that. Congratulations. Yeah. So what are you teaching now? When or what? what? Uh, so I'm teaching. So I'll be teaching two each term. I'll teach one freshman class of that's like a, re, a writing and research um, sequence, and then whatever I want. So it's actually a lot like Empire State. I get to teach whatever I want. It's all exactly. interdisciplinary. Yeah, exactly. Except that I actually am required to teach in my area of specialization and not just whatever I want. If you like. So the exactly. yoga class is out. Huh? Exactly. I always joke that Empire State I could teach neuroscience I if I wanted to. Was I didn't either. I had drinks with someone with a friend of mine who teaches there. He's like, you should apply for this. That's what, yeah, I mean. And I, so I, I did. I looked at the lists. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so Jacob, how are you doing a self-design major at Kenya? Oh. Wait, doesn't everyone in Kenyan must do self design? Well, it? I mean, <laughs> like that sounds very Kenyan to me. Yeah. No, it's actually very. It, it, it's a, a, a very rigorous process to get it approved because it involves three departments. You have to get you know, wow. all three departments to approve it, and then you know deans and all that. And, right. You know, I mean, everyone in Kenyan is only a thousand kids, so it's wait. <laughs> so, um, but chill. Yeah. So she'll be, she'll be intrigued to hear that you're teaching at such a school. Yes, well, I call it a synoptic major. What it, what is, um... I couldn't begin to explain. <laughs> <laughs> well, what's strange about Galton is Galton? Somatics, she calls it. Somatics. It's about the body across the world experience of the body. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah.
department? No. So there are no departments? There's no departments. Um, so? Yeah, so I, so I mean, I'll be teach, I'll teach history, is, is uh -huh. the short answer. Yeah, like, will um, you be, was it a, a open spot for history? No, it was, it was a social scientist who could teach writing. Um, which is not necessarily like how I would have described history. myself. But, yeah, well, but I'll take it. So uh, I want to hear about the interview process. Like, was it kind of standard? Oh yeah, it was. It was very standard. Yeah, exactly. Stuff. Did you do a demo? Teaching demo? No, like a research talk. Right. No, I uh, met with students, but no, we like I had a conversation with them, but no teaching demo. Mm -hmm. um, they were very eager that even though it was a clinical line to sort of reassure that it was a actually a like a. a research job where they cared about research and I would have access, like, access and resources to that. Um, so. Uh, I'm excited. <laughs> so there's an um, environmental historian who is sort of, I think he considers himself more of a historian of science and technology. I forget his last name, but his first name is Eugene. Um, he comes to the, have you been to the New York um, Metropolitan Environmental History Seminars. Do you know about them? No, I should. I we should, should get you on that. Yes, you should list. get me on that list. So we meet a couple times a semester uh, up at Columbia. Now. Oh. I used to be at NYU. It's now at Columbia. Um, oh, never mind. Too far up there. <laughs> um, but there's somebody from Gallatin who comes yeah. like almost every well, almost every time. So I'll have to find out about get that. Your, person. Yeah. Uh, get you and I, I would like to be on that list yeah. um, for this new this new project where I have to Sounds invent good. myself as a environmental historian. Oh, we're always looking for people to present uh, their work, so. Well. <laughs> As you start to develop when, that, when I'll one book. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> when I can figure out how to start the next book. Yeah. So, I think we might as well get started. We may have a flurry of students. Um, unfortunately, we have a competing event next door, which is really popular, and that our center also advertised, so we have, we're advertising competing events. So. <laughs> Apologies for that situation. <laughs> oh. um, but, um, but we have an intimate crowd here. Um, so welcome. Thanks for coming to um, this book event. Um, Jacob Reams' new book, Disaster Citizenship, Survivors, Solidarity, and Power in the North American Progressive Era, is the, um, the topic of the day. Uh, Jacob Reams, as you all know since we've just been talking about it, <laughs> is Assistant Professor of Public Affairs, History, and Labor, His Labor Studies at SUNY Empire State College. He teaches and studies the working class and labor history of North America with a focus on urban disasters, working class organizations, and migration. Um, he is joined by uh, Eric Wallenberg, who's a PhD student in history here at the CUNY Grad Center, who will give a response and perhaps moderate questions after the, the talk. So, um, welcome. Thank you. Thank you, and thank, thank you, uh, and thanks for all, Leave the microphone aside. It's just weirdly there. Um, thank you all for coming, and um, I, I should thank David Stein, who organized this, but who is not here because he has the flu. Um, this is apparently like half the city. I have gotten lots of emails saying, so, "Oh, I would be coming, but I have the flu." So either that is a clever excuse to avoid hearing me talk, or uh, half the city is sick. Uh, so I'm gonna do, what, I, what I will do uh, tonight is uh, read just a little bit to sort of introduce the book and the two, the two disasters that I write about, uh, and then talk very briefly about uh, the idea, why, study, why I am studying disasters, why I think more people should study disasters, um, and then a little bit about these disasters and about the idea of disaster citizenship. Uh, and then the thing that I am most excited about um, is hearing what Eric has to say. So I will try to be short so I can skip to the part I'm excited about. All right, so I'm going to read um, from, from chapter one and then from chapter uh, five, six. Chapter one, chapter six, the first and the last chapters. Um, so I will start with, with Halifax. 
The morning of Thursday, December 6, 1917, started like any other in Halifax Harbor. It was a clear, sunny day, and the harbor was busy with wartime traffic. The Emo, a Norwegian-owned steamer bound from New York to collect supplies for Belgium, had intended to depart the previous evening, but had been delayed, so it was rushing out of the harbor. The French-owned Mont Blanc, bound for Bordeaux, laden with explosives for the front, had arrived late the night before and missed the deadline for entering the harbor, so it too was in a hurry. A bit after nine o'clock in the morning, after circumstances, under circumstances that remain controversial, the two ships collided in the narrows of Halifax Harbor. The munitions on the Mont Blanc caught fire and soon exploded in what has been called the largest man-made explosion before the atomic bomb. 2,000 people died. The Halifax explosion came suddenly, especially in Richmond, a working class neighborhood in the city's north end, where longshoremen, building tradesmen, railway workers, and their families lived. Some people had been watching the Mont Blanc burn, but most Haligonians had not known that there was a ship fire, so they were going about their normal lives, starting school, beginning their workday, cleaning up from breakfast. Suddenly, there was a loud noise. For those south of the devastated area, there, there followed a few minutes of confusion, maybe even an hour or so, as people first imagined the damage to be local and relatively minor. Soon, though, they learned just how bad things were, either by traveling north themselves or by meeting people coming from the North End. For those who started in the North End, it was clear from the beginning that something major had happened. That's embarrassing. <laughs> uh, something major had happened. The explosion knocked down houses and sent shards of glass flying like daggers as survivors started to escape the wreckage and regain their bearings. Uh, they had to contend with rapidly spreading fire sparked by the flying munitions and upended coal stoves. In Richmond, on the steep hill overlooking the Narrows, what had not been destroyed outright by the shock of the explosion burned down. Even in the South End, a district filled with the gracious mansions of the city's elite and more modest houses of its middle class, doors came off the hinges, plaster crashed down from the walls and ceilings, and windows shattered. At that moment, whatever moment a person learned that something extraordinary had happened, normality was suspended. Small children mustered uncommon bravery to rescue their parents from burning and collapsed houses. Working men abandoned their posts, their posts to check on their families, Patients long consigned to the old ladies' home wandered outside for the first time in months or years. Untrained women, once squeamish at the sight of blood, volunteered for hours of nursing duty at hospitals deluged with the wounded. With the mayor traveling and the city council scattered around the town, the, the city's deputy mayor and province's lieutenant governor essentially ceded political authority to a self-constituted group of local worthies. Nearly a quarter century later, writing the novel that remains the foremost cultural depiction of the explosion, Hugh McLennan summed it up. It was all queer. It was a revolution in the nature of things. So that's Halifax. So the, the next section I will read about the Salem fire, it's further along, it's not the, the, the coming of the fire is, is actually kind of less, less interesting. It was a, a, um, a factory fire that started and spread around town. Um, and what I, what I will read is, um, well, it's three days after the Salem fire. At about 10 in the morning, the Sunday, three days after the Salem fire. So the Salem fire is the summer of 1914. I realize I, I didn't say that. At 10 in the morning, the Sunday, three days after the Salem fire, during a lull in the nearly constant rain, a militiaman rang a bell to mark the, mark the hour. Father Donat Binet, arrived at a jerry-rigged wooden altar that soldiers had been building since dawn. Behind him his con was his congregation, 3,000 men, women, and children, all nearly, all, nearly all homeless, miserable, wet, cold, and hungry, in the words of a sympathetic reporter. They were a motley assemblage, the women and men and children of the tented colony, all clad in nondescript garments, ill-fitted and bedraggled. Their faces were gaunt and worn from suffering. Facing the altar, Binet read the mass, occasionally having to pause when emotion overcame him. Kyrie eleison, Christe eleison, he read in Greek, Lord have mercy, Christ have mercy. 
Qui tolis picata mundi miserere nobis, he said in Latin. Probably better than I said in Latin. Uh, Thou who takest away the sins of the world, have mercy upon us. When he finished the hymn of Gloria and Excelsis Deo, Binet turned to face his audience for the collect, an opening prayer. Dominus Fabiscum, he said, the Lord be with you. He spoke in French to his assembled congregation, counseling them to be like Job, to be patient in everything, and everything would come out right. He urged them to be thrifty and sanitary, to take whatever jobs were offered them, and in their new domestic circumstances, to watch out for their daughter's chastity. As he spoke, the clouds grew darker and darker, and soon the driving, pouring rain resumed. Some in the congregation put up umbrellas, including an assistant who held one over Bennett's head, but nobody left the mess. Bennett told his flock not to kneel, since they would get muddy, and he moved on to communion. Since there was no sanctus bell, the bugle call sounded, clear, thrilling, and inspiring, and then came the elevation of the host. Uh, this is a, a quotation. Uh, for a second, as the priest's hand held up the sacred host, his face turned towards the heavens, it grew lighter. The sun showed for the briefest period, and then the torrent fell once more, a Catholic reporter wrote. He was clearly moved by the seeming omen, and so were others at the mass. The people with one accord dropped to their knees in the wet grass and prostrated themselves in adoration. By coincidence, the Bible verses Binet read sounded particularly relevant that Sunday. The reading from the epistles was about, the, was about enduring misery while waiting for God to redeem his people. For I reckon that the sufferings of this time are not worthy to be compared with the glory to come, it began. The gospel reading that followed told the story of Jesus miraculously filling Simon's nets with fish. Though Simon had labored all night without catching any fish, upon Jesus' command, he tried again, and that time enclosed a, great, a very great num multitude of fishes, so many that their nets broke and their ships were filled to, to almost sinking. To those to whom the fire had emptied the nets and ships of a lifetime of labor, the lesson about having faith in God would provide, uh, and having faith that God would provide, would have resonated clearly. So those, um, those, two, those two passages that I read, um, which I mostly read because I, I kind of like them, um, they also, they highlight two of the really, um, two of the central themes of, of my book. One is um, to take, uh, uh, the quote at the, at the end of the Halifax section, the, the, it's all, it was all queer, it was a revolution in the nature of things. One is about the political aspect of disaster, and that disaster and disaster relief is necessarily political. It is about the distribution of scarce resources um, and about the power to decide how to distribute those scarce resources. Um, it, it, it's inescapable that both disaster relief and disaster preparedness will be uh, political processes. And how those, but how those decisions are made, what the politics are going to be, that is up in the air. And that is at the heart of what I'm calling disaster citizenship. That is um, the question of how we organize our societies in everyday pre-disaster life and in post-disaster life. Um, the, the, health, the, the Salem chapter, the chapter about um, Father Burnett, highlights the way this, that work is done, that political work is done in lots of places, some of which are familiar political places and some of which are unfamiliar political places, right? So it, it, that work is done in churches, that work is done in unions, that work is done in families and neighborhoods. Um, and in city council chambers, but in some ways city council chambers are, I want to say the least important place where that political work is done, but it's, it's on, they are only one of, of many. Uh, and not just city council chambers. In fact, in, in Salem, um, these debates about what does society, what does the state owe to citizens in need, extended all the way up to Congress. Uh, which which gave a two hundred thousand um, dollar special appropriation, which was not unusual. On one hand, um, Congress has been giving disaster relief since the early days of the Republic, since the New Madrid earthquake in, 19, in 1813. Um, 
But it was unusual because uh, perhaps for the first time, they were giving money for aid, not just to people who had lost their houses, although that too, but for people whose primary loss was their jobs. So in 1913, which was in the middle of a depression, uh, a recession, uh, there were lots of people without jobs. And people in Congress, and certain people in Congress, wondered why it was the responsibility of the federal government to give the people in Salem without jobs particular aid, but not the people in, say, New York or Boston or San Francisco. Uh, this is one, that question, and the fact that they answered it in the affirmative, right? They answered it with, yes, we are going to give money to these Salemites who are out of a job. That points to some of the power and some of the reason that I think disasters are a particularly interesting and exciting thing to study, because they are moments um, to, to take a, a resonant phrase from the, the long history of welfare, there are moments that create a, a large number of worthy poor, right? So, so throughout the history of Anglo-American welfare, there's been a division between um, giving money to the worthy poor, the people who couldn't work, the people who were poor, not because of their own sins or because of their own laziness or because of their own uh, inferiority, uh, but because they were disabled or because they were encumbered with children or because they were um, otherwise to be pitied. This was, of course, a vanishingly small number. If you're going to have worthy poor and unworthy poor, surprisingly, or unsurprisingly, most people are going to end up in the unworthy poor. But what disasters do is create this, this large number of people all of a sudden who are seen as worthy. This is why, as, as um, the, the sociologist and legal scholar Michelle Landis Dalber says, uh, has taught us in a recent book, why um, in, uh, in the New Deal, there's a lot of reference to emergency, a lot of reference to disaster. There's a very intentional move by New Dealers to call on this tradition of disaster relief and to say the Great Depression was a disaster like the San Francisco fire or the New Madrid Falls earthquake uh, or a flood or a hurricane or a fire. And therefore, the people who were thrown out of work by this great economic disaster deserved aid just like people who were thrown out of work by the Salem fire. Um, and this, I mean, on one hand, this is a, um, a bit of rhetoric, right? This is perhaps a bit of a sort of a legal sleight of hand if there's a, if there's a legal use of a, of a state of emergency in order to give people aid. Um, but it's also a, a very interesting move because what disaster, this is the sort of the second reason I really like, I really think disasters are interesting, is that almost everybody is poor, who is poor, is poor because of a disaster. Perhaps not a disaster like the Salem fire or the Halifax explosion, but a small disaster, a small disaster in their own life. Uh, the, the historian um, Annalise Orlick, who wrote a really masterful book on the welfare rights movement in, uh, in, La in Las Vegas, cha the, her, the chapter in her book when she describes how her protagonists are, uh, were made poor, she titles it, Bad Luck and Lousy People. And it's a quotation from, that, that is a quotation from a popular song. But it's also a summary of the chapter, that the, that the women who she's writing about who were poor were poor because of bad luck and lousy people, because they fell and were injured at work and couldn't work, because they had um, no access to birth control and had 13 children, because they had abusive uh, partners. Those sorts of small disasters, um, those everyday disasters that cast people into poverty paired with the large disaster of capitalism is not, um, has a lot of similarities to, to, this, to the sorts of large scale disasters of the explosion and the fire that, that I'm writing about. The one, one more reason, uh, before I move on to a disaster citizenship, but one more reason that I think disasters are really important thing for us to be thinking about right now 
is that we are seeing and will continue to see more and more disasters. Uh, and I use seeing in a sort of a double sense, right? We're going to see more disasters because there are going to be, there are already are more disasters. Climate change has meant uh, that we, that there is a greater amount of um, precipitation in extreme weather events than there has been before. Uh, there is a greater amount of, there is a greater heat spell, uh, heat, um, heat waves and droughts than there have been before. And that the chronic effects of climate change, including coastal erosion, means that, there, that we are more susceptible to the floods that do happen. Um, we, are also, we are also seeing more disasters in a literal sense. That the disasters that happen around the world, we, are, we in New York are more likely to see. Uh, a really stark example of this is that almost nobody in the United States knew what a tsunami looked like before 2004, or before, yeah, before 2004, before the Indian Ocean tsunami. Some people knew after that. Now, after the, the uh, March 11th the disaster in Japan three years, uh, five years ago, lots of people know what tsunamis look like because the, the technologies, both the, the, the video technologies and phones, and then the communications technologies that allow us to see those films that people, that people make, spread the news of and spread the images of disaster in a way faster and farther and in a more visceral way than has happened before. So we are seeing, so as I say, we are seeing more and more disasters. And they are, as a result, shaping both the politics of the places that suffer the disasters, but also shaping the politics of disaster um, so the politics of the people who witness the disaster from afar more and more. So I think it is, um, I think it is incumbent on us to be under, to understand these processes of, of how disaster works, of how disaster relief works, how disaster rebuilding works, because we're going to be doing more and more of it. So how does it work? Uh, a key part of it, as I describe, is what I call disaster citizenship. Um, so just one thing about disaster citizenship, I mean, one, one thing of what I mean is that it was actually, I, I coined it as a phrase before I coined it as an argument. Um, it, it seemed like a nice, I was, it seemed like a nice title. I was told, um, that I couldn't use the same title for my book as I used for my dissertation. So I had to come up with a new title and, um, and Naomi Klein in her, uh, book, The Shock Doctrine has this phrase, disaster capitalism. And Naomi Klein's argument is that disasters are times of danger and times of weakness. That they, she, she, the central metaphor of the book is electroshock therapy. That uh, just as she says, and actually I have no idea whether this is true about electroshock therapy, but just as shock therapy breaks down the patient's personality and then allows the doctor to rebuild it fresh, so too, she says, does... Um, disaster provide a shock to break down society, to break down civil society, to break down democracy, and then allow her neoliberal malefactors, who are the central characters of the book, to rebuild society in the way that they want. The problem with that is that that is not actually what disasters do. Disasters do not actually break down society. Disasters do not actually make us weaker and more malleable and more pliant and more likely to accept um, the Chicago boys or the the, um, the privations of, of what she calls disaster capitalism. Disasters actually are moments in which people come together and in which Margaret Thatcher's famous phrase that there is no such thing as society is proven wrong. That society, that, that, this is, that disasters are when society is strong. It's when people come together. It's when, uh, to use an example from my own life, when Sandy hit, when the surf club that surfed off of the Rockaways went from being a surf club of people who liked surfing and knew each other from that to being a moment that helped each other and helped strangers and delivered food in public housing um, in, in the Rockaways. It's, this, it's a moment, if they become moments in which um, neighbors help neighbors, in which family um, goes, goes farther, and helps each other 
um, in which people forge new connections, in which people reimagine what citizenship can be. And it often is stronger. There are, there are sort of four elements of this strengthened, newfound citizenship. One is that um, people reject the imposition, or people have rejected. I've been talking in the present tense, but I, I, as a historian, I sort of want to go back into the past tense and, and talk specifically about my disasters, talk specifically about the progressive era. The people rejected the imposition of borders. This is a mo um, the progressive era, or, or even more broadly, say the moment from the, the um, collapse of the first international in the early 1870s to, um, you can say, Versailles in 1919, or perhaps the 1924 uh, US immigration law that, that really cuts off immigration and creates national quotas. Those as sort of as bookends. That period, the 1870s to the 1920s, is a time of internationally of greater and greater regulation of migration, thickening borders. Um, so, starting in the 1870s, you start getting restrictions of Asian immigration in the United States. Uh, in the 1880s, as you get more and more immigration for a variety of reasons, you also start getting more and more restriction of immigration. Uh, in lots of countries, in the United States, in Canada, in Britain, in France. In the, most crucially for my two disasters, the border between the United States and Canada, thickens really crucially in 1906. It's not only in 1906 that anyone starts to write down the, no, the names of people who are crossing the US-Canada border. Before that, you could come and go as you chose. No one, no one even paid attention. There was customs, but there was no immigration procedure. After 1906, there was still not much. They just wrote down people's names. So there's this, there's this straight, there's this thickening border. What people do though is they reject that border. They build um, the, the people in my in my story build a transnational polity. So in, after the Halifax explosion, um, one of the famous stories that comes from. Uh, comes from the Halifax explosion is that the people of Massachusetts give seven hundred thousand uh, dollars to aid uh, to aid Halifax. Now the people of Massachusetts are not necessarily the people; they're not Brahmins, old stock Bostonians. Most of them are probably who are giving money are probably migrants or the children of migrants from Nova Scotia. Right. So this is all built on migration, but they give money to to help people in Halifax. But if they don't stop at giving money. They then demand power based on the money that they have given. So people in Massachusetts are writing letters to elected officials in Nova Scotia saying, I gave money, and yet my cousin hasn't gotten her share. I demand that you give her more relief. But then it works in the other direction also. So people in Halifax write to the governor of Massachusetts and say, I keep hearing about all this money that Massachusetts gave, gave, and I haven't seen any of it. I would like some of it, please. <laughs> and some of that works. I mean, actually, to a remarkable extent, what, that, what those letters do is it gets them, it gets the officials to look again at the files, to look again um, and sort of double check. But what it shows is that despite being on opposite sides of the frontier, this, of the international border, despite being officially in a different state, people understood themselves through this, this transnational giving to have some power, have be a member of a political community that crossed an international border. The, the, the second, um, um, these are not necessarily, these are not particularly ordered. The second big thing that, um, is part of disaster citizenship, is that people organized in new ways. Uh, and this was true in neighborhoods where neighbors got to, in after Halifax, after the Halifax explosion, got together and built a shack together and lived together and reorganized their lot, their really, their intimate lives of living together in new ways. It's true in churches. So in Halifax, a, um, a, a, uh, <clears throat> Methodist church and a Presbyterian church come together, rebuild into a single church, and merge as one. Um, 
which is not an idea that they had invented. There had been a lot of discussion about the Methodists and the Presbyterians in Canada merging um, for, for years. And in fact, nationally, they would merge in 1925. But 1925 was after 1917, right? So the, the disaster encouraged people to rebuild in a new way and to imagine their communities and the organizations in their communities in new ways. And in um, Salem, where actually I talk about this the most, people organize unions in a different way. So um, one of the notable things in the labor history of textile mills in Massachusetts is a real difficulty in building industrial unions. So a real difficulty in getting people of different workers of different um, skill levels to organize into a single union. And Salem is a is a exception to this. Salem is a place where people actually do organize into a single union from the most skilled, from the loom fixers, who are the most skilled people in a, in a textile factory, to, um, to the women who tended the looms, who had the least skilled um, jobs. You'll know, this is also a, um, a cross-gender union, so women and men were in the same union. And they organized, in a, and, and as time went on, into the 20s, they organized in a way that was focused on building power within the factory. So rather than focusing on um, having on bread and butter issues, wages, number of hours worked, number of jobs, they instead, uh, they in fact gave up a lot. They, they, they read to higher productivity to a stretch out of more, uh, each person tending a greater number of looms in exchange for the union getting to decide how that was going to work. So workers, the idea was, uh, that workers were going to take a greater role in running the factory, taking over from the traditional prerogatives of management, including who was going to get hired, who was going to get fired, how training was going to happen, even how marketing, marketing got taken over by the union. So all these traditional things that um, that management does, uh, they ended, the union ended up doing until a generation later the union sort of the, gets taken over by a, an autocratic, an autocratic union boss who is rumored to own stock in the factory and he appoints to this committee that runs the, the stretch out, he appoints people who want to become managers and then the workers rebel. So this all sort of falls apart in the 30s. But the, but the, what happens in the aftermath of the fire is that people are organizing in new and different ways. They're imagining new ways that they can form communities, new ways that their organizations and their institutions can act in the world. The third, um, and in some ways perhaps most important aspect of what I'm calling disaster citizenship, is this new relation is a new relationship to the government and in particular to the part of the government that's giving disaster survivors aid. Essentially what, um, what survivors wanted was to maximize the amount of uh, relief that they got, the amount of money that they got, the amount of material aid that they got, but to minimize what the government got in return. And what the government wanted in return was uh, power. Right? Was, was authority over people's lives. That's essentially what the government always wants from people to whom they give aid. They always want some ability to regulate those people's lives. And um, so you see this constant trade-off uh, between, as people go back and forth between wanting to maximize this aid, but minimize the authority and the independence that they give up. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna end by, by summarizing a story, it's, a, it's, a, it's actually one of my favorite, um, one of my favorite stories from, from this book. It's a woman named Rita Marigi, who was a semi-literate Italian immigrant who lived in Halifax. Her husband had been a longshoreman who died in the explosion. It took uh, them five days to find his body. She lived in a house that was even before the disaster, slummy at best. After the disaster, falling, falling down, an inspector reported a stench from the basement, plastered down, 
uh, the ceiling falling apart. The landlord wanted to demolish the building and start again, so he was uninterested and refused to make uh, repairs. And so she, the, the relief commission actually found her. She had, two, she had three, two small boys and an infant girl. And they found her. And she said, what I need is help to move to my mother's. Right? So she needs official help to get this unofficial support from her mother. But the problem is that she and her mother did not get along. Uh, she actually does go to her mother, but then her mother kicks her out. Uh, she goes to a um, she goes to a, an old employer of hers, but that also doesn't work. So she goes, she keeps trying these informal modes of support. She goes to her mother. She goes to these um, these this ex employer. Her infant is too much for her, and she tries an informal adoption to the Greek repute, of questionable repute, actually there's a lot of question in the file about just what was going on in Peter the Greek's house. Um, I, I would say one of the things I learned is that you probably shouldn't trust a person who is identified as Peter the Greek, uh, who, who runs a boarding house for sailors. Um, but so Peter the Greek offers to take in the baby and they go back and forth, right? So, so she's trying to get this informal support, but whenever the informal support doesn't work, right, when her mother throws her out when she actually decides that she goes back to Peter the Greek to take back her baby. The government gets back involved. She, she, she needs help when the, when the informal support fails her. And then when the government demands too much, for instance, when the government requires her to send her baby to the orphanage, then she goes back to the informal support. And she spends, this woman who was 19 at the time of the, the fire, uh, of the explosion, spends her entire life bouncing back and forth between the formal support and aid of the state of the, of the Welfare Commission and the informal support of people around her. And it culminates, at least in the file, it culminates with her marrying a man named John Dill. She marries him in a Presbyterian church. Um, and when she marries him, she loses her widow's pension because she's no longer a widow, she's married. Instead, she gets a $500 dowry, a one-time payoff from the, from the Relief Commission. So she gets married, right? So she loses her monthly pension that she gets from the government, but in exchange, she gets a different kind of stability. She gets a different kind of support from the husband. Well, but then the next time we see her, she is, her husband has forced her to, to send off one of her sons uh, this is now in the 30s, so it's during the Depression, send off one of her sons because he's costing too much money. So she goes to the Relief Commission for help, right? So the, the informal support of, the, of her husband is, is demanding too much, so she goes to the government. The government then demands too much, demands that the son go to the, the poorhouse, so she goes back to her husband. The husband then beats her up, and she goes back to the government to prosecute him uh, for, for assault. And then, this is the last time we see her, uh, this second to last time we see her in the file. She drops her case against her husband, but says, and this is in the newspaper, she says, if it happens again, she's gonna go back to court. Right, so up into, this is now 15 years after the explosion, she's still balancing these two different types of support she gets. The, the informal from her friends, her family, her husband, which has its own trade-offs, its own clear negatives, and then the um, tra balancing that with the government, which is more impersonal, which is good and bad in different ways. So this, this story highlights, I, I mean, it highlights this, this central tension in disaster relief about the aid that people get or don't get. And it also highlights, I think, the way, the similarities in that this disaster story that I am telling, or these disaster stories that I am telling, have in common with other forms of welfare history, other forms of government support. Um, and I guess this is, this is really the last part of my, my pitch for why we should care about disasters, not just as the, the cinematic exciting disasters, but as something that, that seems central to our lives. Is that similarity? And is the way that disaster looks a lot like other forms of government aid? I was... Um, this afternoon, I was actually, I had a conversation with a reporter from The Guardian who was writing a piece about uh, a, a trend right now in Oregon and in Portland, San Francisco, 
Los Angeles, Seattle, and Hawaii to declare a state of emergency about homelessness. And um, I actually thought when, when she first contacted me about this, I thought, oh, this is the government declaring a state of emergency to clear off homeless encampments, and this is about the police state destroying things. And in fact, it's the opposite. It's actually it's something that homeless activists are pushing as a way of forcing the government to provide more housing. And this rhetoric of disaster, I think, is really meaningful, right? What does it mean to say that all of a sudden homelessness in San Francisco is a crisis, is an emergency, when in fact it's been a crisis for the last 30 years? And thinking about how disaster, the rhetoric of disaster and the experience of disaster shapes the way that we uh, get access to government services and the way government services are offered, I think it is um, going to increasingly be a, a central way that we need to be thinking about and approaching the state. So I'm going to stop talking. And um, like I said, I'm, I'm really looking forward to what you're asking. Thank you. And I'll, I'll be back for questions. I think I may just stay sitting if people can hear me from here. All right. Does that work? Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I'll just take about ten minutes. Yeah. Is that the plan? Sure. <laughs> okay. I don't think I'm too much over that. If maybe <laughs> just a little bit. Um, so, so I find uh, Dr. Reem's book valuable for a number of reasons, and it's Reem's, yeah. Did it's Remus, but it's okay. it's Remus. That's what I wanted to make sure. So I have good to know. Correct. She gets Remus. 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 Like Remus. uncle. We should know. <laughs> good. Like uncle. Okay. <laughs> Dr. Remus's book, Valuable for a Number of Reasons. So first, he brings together scholarship on a variety of topics in new and useful ways. Um, this is most clear in his work covering the history of disasters and placing it in the context of the progressive era, uh, with its reformers and with agitation for state intervention into people's lives. In the words of Professor Remus, this state intervention is justified by the state as necessary in order to rescue people. Um, and he notes that this includes everyone from drinkers to Cubans and Filipinos. The state justifies its existence, even its force, by invoking the necessity to rescue a population in need. Uh, a central theme of disaster, disaster citizenship is the extensive network of communities that people draw on in times of disaster. Uh, these include networks we don't often see or that we find hard to explicate from the historical record. Um, like the everyday interactions people have with their neighbors and coworkers. Uh, in times of disaster, Professor Remus has found uh, where these relationships are recorded, and he brings to light the networks created by union membership and activity, and church life in particular, which shows the human solidarity that is present in some of the most difficult of circumstances. He finds that these networks were in a moment of change in the progressive era, um, and I immediately thought of the work of Elizabeth Cohen's Making a New Deal, which also shows working class organizations in flux. Um, I think disaster citizenship adds to Professor Cohen's work um, this important factor of disaster to how these working class organizations functioned and then I think changed in this era. So she talks about it in changing for because of the economic crisis a little bit after your time period um, during the Depression, really. But I think this adds a, another element to, to how, wh how and why uh, change, change in these organizations occurs. Professor Remus does much more with his book, uh, showing how popular expectations of the state, civil society, and individuals evolved in part due to disaster. The growing welfare state suggests the problem of how the new state apparatus would deal with previous civil society forms of welfare. And disaster citizenship adds the comparative question by looking at Canada and the United States, and more particularly, looking at populations that move between uh, the two countries, or had connections between the two countries. And he's obviously spoken to that here. Um, borrowing from James Scott's ideas of legibility, he argues that the state needed, or maybe wanted, I'm not sure, more legibility of its territory, as well as its citizens, uh, if, it was to if it was to provide relief. 
um, what the state could not do, Professor Remus sets out to do, um, namely to see how local citizens aided each other. And so I want to quote a little bit from you, if that's OK. That's not too weird. <laughs> Um, so he writes, the architecture of mutual aid was multifaceted and included families, neighborhoods, friendships, churches, unions, and fraternal societies. I ask how civil society responded to the growth of the progressive state. I offer not only a, historic, a social history of the state's expansion, but of the alternatives people and organizations offered to it as well. And it is here where I think the book really shines. Uh, Disaster Citizenship is a fantastic collection of what local people were experiencing and building on the ground in Halifax and Salem in the face of enormous disaster and personal tragedy. Uh, Professor Remus adds much needed historical perspective to this reality, uh, and he has the sources to back it up. Um, so he cites work in archives, I think, in, from what I could count, in nearly 20 different cities, um, it's an extensive, uh, extensive set of archives that he draws on. Uh, <clears throat> now, Halifax and Salem are very different. Uh, the times are, you know, he notes are different. It's progressive era, but they're, they're different years um, by, I don't know, five, six, seven years maybe. Um, and yet through this book, we see how disasters are key moments in the construction of the progressive state and how survivors worked to build citizenship that responded to this new form of governance. In Salem, if you wanted aid, then you had to accept the military authority of, camp, of the camps that people were sent to. The camp's central knowledge over local knowledge made them easier to govern, but they made them harder to live in. So who was being helped here? Those seeking order, a regularized, policeable, and findable workforce, certainly, I think. Um, but the state's attempt to get camp workers to police each other also failed. Instead of turning in fakers, um, those that, that, uh, that Professor Remus talks about who might be attempting to profit off uh, of the aid provided that the state's very concerned about, these camp members, um, Professor Remus argues they instead the people in the camp created a moral economy of solidarity, finding their interests better served this way than in turning in fellows in need. Uh, in, in your own words, again. <laughs> You say, uh, you write, in building and defending this moral economy, camp residents were not only demonstrating their solidarity with their neighbors and compatriots, they also resisted those who controlled the relief effort. This does not imply that no refugees were strictly self-serving, but rather that collectively, refugees crafted an implicit agreement about the appropriate extent of such behavior. Similarly, in Halifax, people avoided the camps and crowds, preferring to stay with friends and family. And I'll just give you guys a sense of that as well here. So Haligonians, which I did not know that's what you would call people from Halifax, Haligonians, something new, like Salamites, uh, engaged in delicate, subtle, and often tacit negotiations, seeking to maximize the material aid they claimed from the state while minimizing the autonomy and privacy the state took from them in return. To do this, they carefully inserted this new form of labor, labor, that of applying for, managing, and retaining state benefits into their pre-existing family economies. And I think you've spoken to that, and I think that comes through very, very clearly. Uh, disaster citizenship shows the delicate balance between collecting aid and preserving autonomy. We get a glimpse of what wages for housework might look like uh, when in the aftermath of the Halifax explosion, women who died or were incapacitated received money or their families received money, depending on the case, in compensation for their lost ability to work in the home. And I should say, and he does say, that albeit this is you know, much less than the value of their work and certainly less than their husbands were making outside of the home. And still, we learn that these housework pensions were rare were not a common occurrence. Um, but it, it's, it's a moment, and you, you get a sense of what's possible here. So this brings me to another set of important topics that Professor Remus uh, brings into conversation with disaster citizenship. Um, I see his book as centrally in conversation with another book on disaster that he has, of course, mentioned now, uh, Naomi Klein's The Shock Doctrine, The Rise of Disaster Capitalism, 
popularize the idea of the post-disaster imposition by governments of their dictates. And while this may be true in Klein's examples, and I don't know, I'd be interested to hear what you think, if you do think that they're true in her examples or not, it sounds like maybe not. <laughs> uh, Professor Remus finds much more competition for what a post-disaster world will look like. While middle-class reformers and the state more generally attempt to impose their own will to remake these societies, he shows working-class communities attempting to gain aid from the state, but on their own terms. People want aid, but they also want to be able to direct it and maintain their own dignity and say. And this is the last time I'll quote it. <laughs> so he writes. So he writes, workers and their families in the chapters that follow, so this is his introduction, <laughs> uh, did not placidly accept the imposition of marginal and technocratic progressive governance. Rather, they worked to shape the new state. Working class people wanted state support. They wanted to get as much as they could from the pre-existing organs of the state and from the new ones that were built in disaster's aftermath. But they also wanted to preserve their own independence and autonomy. This meant subverting the state's demands for power and authority and balancing those demands with their own. In other words, they wanted relief on their own terms to receive state aid while simultaneously retaining power and dignity. Um, the communities that come together in the face of disaster shown here seem to be much closer to those we find in Rebecca Solnit's A Paradise Built in Hell, the extraordinary communities that arise in disaster. And I hope that you might say a word on how you see your book in relation to these other two important books. Um, you seem to be exploring this tension of disaster capitalism and community resilience, and I just would be curious to hear more about how you see that tension there um, of these two things happening or, or not, um, if one's more dominant than the other. So for, and maybe I actually will skip this because you talked quite a bit about what you meant by disaster citizenship. And I was going to ask you to talk a little bit more about that, but I think that was, I think you, you, um, you gave us a good sense of, of, of uh, what you mean with that term. So in well disaster citizen, Ships focuses on two disasters I would venture not many people here are familiar with. Uh, Professor Remus takes care to remind us of their place among many others, from the great flood of, of the Mississippi in 1927, where black Americans in particular were forced to work on broken levees while discriminated against in aid provided by the Red Cross, uh, to New Orleans and the Louisiana coast in the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina, where the state did not simply ignore people and let them in their city drown, but carried out a brutal treatment of survivors and sanctioned or turned away uh, from vigilante violence committed against victims of the flood. As the utter contempt of the federal government became the standard, uh, organizations like Common Ground Relief, um, which I actually had a chance to work with uh, in, after uh, Hurricane Katrina, in the months after Hurricane Katrina, uh, and other groups have continued to organize not just to rebuild uh, community infrastructure like homes and churches, but to offer legal and medical services, job training and environmental restoration, as well as food, clothing, and other everyday necessities. And to be clear, these were not services provided by outside entities. Common Ground's slogan of solidarity, not charity, means that this work and these services came from the community itself, organized together, and directing any outsiders in what was and is needed and how it should and would be provided. Here in New York City, we saw the continuation of this uh, contempt, I would say, but maybe other people use different words, for, for working class people's lives in the aftermath of Superstorm Sandy, as aid was slow to materialize or non-existent in some extent, to some extent. The aid that did come was in many cases organized in the affected communities by Occupy Sandy and unaffiliated individuals in the community. Disaster citizenship certainly has much to teach us about communities of resilience in the face of disaster and the role the state is likely to play. And considering the increasing environmental catastrophes, the oil spills, the natural gas explosions, the increasing frequency of exploding oil trains, uh, we could look at Flint today, uh, we unfortunately are likely to find ourselves in need of turning to this book for ideas and answers to some of society's biggest challenges, and I think that we'll find much here to help us. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, 
so I, I thought I would um, throw it up before I, I can go back to the, particularly the question that, that Eric asked about um, placing myself in, in, in context of, of Klein and Solnit. I, I could talk about that, but I, I feel like I've been talking a lot. So I'm, I'm actually I'm really excited to get some questions, and then we can do that. Okay, we can go oh, back absolutely. to we can go back to my my response to your response. And I have other questions too. <laughs> but I yeah, yeah. Um, thank you. That's awesome. And I haven't read the books. So I apologize if I'm asking a question. But I'm wondering if you could talk about race and racism, the role of that, and everything, and like when you were defining disaster citizenship, you were talking about how disasters happened disasters made people poor. I was thinking, well, what about structural disadvantage and things like that? Like, um, so I'm just wondering about that. And, and also, like, immigration at the time, which I'm sure you know, the kind of hierarchy of white races, and the whole thing you're talking about the end is Italian-Americans. I'm wondering how. Italian-Canadian, but yes. <laughs> um, and just that, and how race relations were, you know, the, the white races were becoming conglomerated at that point. Yeah, so, so that's a really interesting question. And one of the key things that happens in, um, so the, the, I didn't go into this particularly, but the, in, in Salem, 43% of the people affected were French Canadians or French Canadian descendants. And we, we now think of French Canadians as being kind of very white. Um, but French Canadians were at this point sort of just getting, just whitening. Um, there's a, a famous line that a, a Massachusetts labor official used, had used 20 years or so earlier, that the French Canadians were, um, or Canadians at that point, were the Chinese of the Eastern states, which is to say that for sort of reasons of, racial, of imagined racial inferiority, they were willing to work too hard, put, in their, put their children to work, and therefore and not assimilate, and therefore put uh, in danger the good white Americans who um, who who would be who would be under who be underbid for for work. So there is um, there is certainly an element of that whitening story. Um, although in fact I don't talk about it, it that much. But there's 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 an interesting there's an interesting thing that goes on in both of these cities. There's and, and this is going to be, I think, going to be true in, this is the sort of the difficulty and the irony of relying on and celebrating local informal responses, right? That they can, that they can be and often are deeply exclusive, right? That, that who gets to be a local person is very often determined by race. Uh, and so you get stories of um, both discrimination at an official level, um, that there were there were few, if any, uh, African Americans in Salem. I don't know that I saw a reference to any. Uh, in Halifax, there are. Halifax actually has a has a rather large black population. Um, has since uh, the American Revolution, uh, since since Amer since uh, formerly enslaved refugees went to went to Nova Scotia. Um, who were um, cert who were certainly treated less, who certainly got less material aid than um, than their white neighbors, and were excluded by their white neighbors in both formal and informal ways. At the same time, one of the things that we uh, that I saw in particularly in Halifax was. Um, actually increased inclusion. So uh, this is a moment in which Canadian Pullman porters are organizing unions and in particular demanding that their union be allowed be allowed to affiliate with the national union of Rail the Canadian Brotherhood of Railroad Employees. Um, and it's a little, the records are, I confess, kind of unclear. But what I uh, what I think that I see is that Halifax workers, after the explosion, express more interest and more willingness to let their black co-workers into their union. And um, railroad unions in both the United States and Canada are 
have been notoriously racist, do not integrate until they're in the United States, do not integrate until they're forced to by the federal courts in the late 60s. Um, and so this is kind of an, un, this is a definitely an unusual moment in which workers seem to be saying, we should let, we should organize with our coworkers and that this happens in the aftermath of the explosion. And this I think is part of what, this is what I'm, part of what I'm talking about when I say that um, people imagine new ways of forming their communities. People imagine new, um, new bonds of solidarity. Um, now that said, I, I, I don't want to sugarcoat it. There's a, uh, it actually didn't make it into the book. I turned it into a standalone article about native people in the Halifax explosion, a, a community across the harbor in a town called Dartmouth of uh, Mi'kmaq native people who, um, who are thoroughly racialized and are treated as a group apart. And this is actually sort of the first or the second step in expelling them from the city entirely. Um, so I don't want to sugarcoat it and, and, and say that there is a sort of newfound interracial harmony, um, a phrase that I'm using, to be clear, a phrase that I'm using ironically. Um, but, but there is some of that. And I think this is, this is part of the sort of the, in, the interesting ironies of disaster, that things are going in both directions, that there's both exclusion and greater inclusion, um, just as there is both more interest in the state and more resistance to it. Does that answer your question? I think so. Yeah, yeah Dan. Um, so I, I also haven't yet read the book, so I apologize. As far as I know, no one has read the book here. Right, so. Fair enough. So <laughs> this is already covered yeah. in the book, then feel free to tell me it just be quick. Okay. Um, but um, one thing I, I, I was curious about as, as you're talking about, um, you know, especially how communities kind of reform and, and remount themselves in, in, in the context of disaster. Um, so it's so like when, when a disaster happens, right, like you have a, especially in those cases, a very sharp transition from like a normal state to a disaster state. And that triggers people to behave in different ways, and communities to behave in different ways, and so on. Um, and I'm just curious, did you also, you know, look at it and what are your thoughts on the transition kind of on the other side of that, which is presumably much slower back from disaster to, to normalcy? And have you found that the, you know, community changes to some degree are, are permanent? Are they temporary? To the extent they're temporary, do they just sort of dissipate gradually? Or, yeah. So this is something I really struggled with in writing the book because I really struggled with when do I end it and when is so this, this there's a story I tell about a strike in the early 30s and sort of this question that not only I had but my readers had and my and my the reviewers the press reviewers had of like why is this story in the 1930s part of a book about and it was in Salem so it was like from 1914 to 1933 is a pretty broad range. And so it's something I really struggled with to figure out when does that end. Um, and so I, I mean, I, to, so I think part of the answer is it's very gradual, right? Like there is no moment at which one says, okay, the disaster's over. Um, for the people, for many of the people who lived it, right, that is particularly particularly actually in Halifax, where there was much more um, physiological, in, where there was much more injury. People lived it forever. Um, there are people going to uh, the doctor for disaster-related injury and getting it paid for by the Relief Commission into the 1960s as they're, as they're dying of old age. Um, I think that's true. Um, so, but the, but the, but I, but there is actually, but I think I can also give a more specific date, which is when does that both of the projects of what sort of what I'm calling disaster citizenship of these experiments in new ways of organizing, new ways of responding to the state, they both fail, right? They both fail and kind of labor historians, they both fail and lost strikes. Um, 
So in Halifax, uh, you get in the early 20s, you get this, um, the Halifax labor movement organizes a labor party. They start, uh, they start talking about, and the big thing they organize on is not wages and conditions, or they talk about that some, but they talk about the housing crisis. Not surprising that there's a housing crisis after a quarter of the city has been destroyed. They talk about schools. Uh, so they're talking about these questions, these sort of questions of home and these questions of reproduction. Um, and then they, and then there's a, and at the same time, actually, literally at the same time that there's a provincial election, there's in which the the, the Labor Party is is campaigning. Um, there's a strike on the dockyards for traditional strike reasons, and both of these lose at the same time. The the Labor Party loses the election. The strike is a total failure. The union is destroyed. Um, and what you and so you can say 1923. That's the end of that particular moment. And what you get instead in Nova Scotia is something called the Maritime Rights Movement, which is this very, which is a cross-class, very conservative sort of turn to tradition, turn to fetishizing Celtic rural life, um, and it's maritime rights because it's all about sort of blaming Ottawa, blaming the Confederation of Canada for the ills of, for the economic ills of Nova Scotia. There's a there's a great line from a novelist that um, the that the 1920s in Nova Scotia were a dress rehearsal for the 1930s in the rest of North America. Um, so, so you could say 19, 1923, and then in Salem, the the collapse of this union experiment that I described of of trading the stretch out for getting more authority that fails. In the in the thirties, when workers rebel against the union that has become autocratic. So I, I mean, in my in the book, those are the end dates that I use for those two for those two events. And, I, and so I think, but I think that those that's a contingent answer, right? Like that is an answer that is specific to Salem and Halifax, as you can see. Right, like one's a generation later, one is just a few years later. I think that other disasters we're going to see in different ways. I think that sort of the the so called end point of Katrina has not yet been reached, right? Um, ha, uh, New Orleans is still dealing, is still shaped by Katrina. The fights over New Orleans, the political fights in New Orleans are still post-Katrina fights, as I understand it. I do not claim to be an expert in, in New Orleans. Um, I know slightly more, perhaps more, about sort of the post-311 post Japanese um, politics, and we are still clearly in a post-311 political moment in Japan. And, that, and so I think, it, I think that ends at different points for different disasters, um, but it definitely is a, it is a gradual dissipation. Ben, are you also going to start by saying that you didn't read the book? I wasn't planning to either. <laughs> <laughs> like a typical student. <laughs> So, Professor Reem, I think uh, this idea of, of, the, of the worthy poor by itself doesn't get me all that excited, but the story you told about the worthy poor within the context of here's the disaster, let's give these folks aid, versus here's the economic disaster of the New Deal, and they're jobless, and they're jobless, why these folks get aid. I mean, there's something very politically powerful there that I'd like, I'd like to hear you explore a little more. I mean, it's, it's, it just seems, it's, it's a fascinating idea that, and it speaks to the questions of race and who is worthy or not, and is it a question of empathy, or is it a question of it could happen to me, and that is the same as empathy, or is it some other impulse, and the inclusion, exclusion, all, all these things you're playing with strike me as politically very meaningful. I don't, I don't know exactly what to do with them, but I, I'd like that one story as an entry point to that conversation. So I think there's, there, so I'm going to answer that in two ways. One is in, so one is this sort of the New Deal story, which is not my story. It's, I'm, I'm really, I recommend The Sympathetic State by, by Michelle landis Stalber, who's who really talks about this and who talks about the very intentional way that Roosevelt and Harry Hopkins use the language of, of emergency and use the language of disaster and the rhetoric of it in order to um, 
in order to mobilize the, for the New Deal, right? There's a reason that it's the Federal Emergency Recovery Act, that that matter of emergency was really key. Um, and that, and, and she actually spends a chapter analyzing the letters written, um, letters written by individuals to the Roosevelts. There's a huge archive of this, and she does a, she's a sociologist, she does this sort of weird quantitative, she turns these letters into quantitative data in a way that I don't really approve of. But, uh, sociologists. <laughs> but, um, uh, but when she, but when she, <laughs> but the but the but the argument that she makes is that not only is not only is the administration politically for their own purposes right using using this this rhetoric which I think she sort of says yeah this is just rhetoric this is just propaganda it's not they they understand what they're doing but that the people writing letters they're also telling a story they're telling stories that that go along with disaster narratives that their story is I am a good upstanding citizen, and then there is this force outside of me that upended my life. And no, uh, right, and like that force in the, in the structure of the story that they're telling, the stories that they're telling, that force could be a hurricane or it could be an earthquake, but it just happens to be a Great Depression. Um, and, and so it, pres and then she also, she also actually spends a lot of time talking about the, um, the, the photographs, the, the Farm Security Administration photographs that were taken that Dorothea Lange and um, Ansel Adams and whatnot went around and took pictures and how they were, the ones that were chosen to be publicized were ones that emphasized um, femininity that, that took out um, particularly strong men, right, to sort of emphasize that these were worthy poor, that these were people who deserved it, that whitened people, often that actually literally whitened people, like people's skin tones were made to look later. Um, as a way of emphasizing the again the sort of the worthiness of of them in mid-century American terms, but this is also I mean this is obviously as that story suggests there's a double-edgedness to this. So in Halifax, as a, a lot of what that that Boston money that I described, a lot of that went to buying people new furniture. Um, but there's this. There's a very deliberate and explicit idea that people are going to be returned to their pre-disaster status. So if you were middle class and had nice furniture, they would buy you nice furniture. If you were working class and had crummy furniture, they would buy you used furniture. Because God forbid that people get something, be, be, be given a... a more than what they had to give. The whole idea was that we're supposed to be giving you just to the level of the disaster. You actually get this in this, this very interesting thing with, with ministers. So ministers were used as to sort of vouch for, for people. Yes, this person really does need the aid that they're, that they're asking for. But ministers who are used to dealing with charity, right, they would say, thinking that it was helpful, these people are so poor. They're, these people are good, but they're poor. They've always been poor. They just need some help. And that was the worst thing that they could say because the social workers would say, well, these people were poor before the disaster. I'm not going to give them anything. What they were supposed to, what the priests were supposed to, or the ministers were supposed to say was, these people were middle class before the disaster. Now they're poor, and therefore they need to make up the difference. And so there's a, um, this emphasis on worthy on the way that disasters make middle class people poor is great if you're middle class, it's less good if you're poor, or less good if you were poor to begin with. I think what's, what's interesting though is that I, I'm not, that's true sort of in the macro level. I think that there were in fact poor people, poor Haligonians who do get more after the explosion than they would have before the explosion, right? And part of that is there's the creation of a, of a welfare state and of this apparatus that's giving out money and giving out furniture. There, there wasn't before. Um, and so I think that, that, that the creation of the disaster state, the disaster apparatus, 
ends up having sort of a spillover effect and helping people who it's not quite intended to help or not intended to help as much. Um, so this is this is one of the way one of the places where I think it's we can point to possibilities more than we can point to what actually happened. Right? So I think, and I, again, this this conversation I was having uh, with the Guardian reporter this this afternoon points to this, right? Points to the way that the rhetoric of disaster can can perhaps move the state of California or the city of Los Angeles or the city of San Francisco to do more for a homeless population than it would have done without the, the rhetoric and the legal structure of disaster. Maybe, if people push. All of this is contingent on actual organizing and people actually pushing. Yeah, Jack. Uh, once again, you in Nova Scotia in particular, in Halifax in particular, you had a disaster where everyone is sitting around and then kaboom, kind of like a Lake Megante situation. Yep. Um, but with these references I hear to climate change, we have a disaster that we're sure is going to happen. Um, and uh, it's going to take a while. It'll be, of course, many small disasters or many big disasters, but we know what the disaster is going to look like pretty well at this point in 2050 and 2070 and 2100. Given that, do you think that the dynamic between um, these two forces, the government or the, the people, would be different? Or would you expect that we're in for 100 years of this kind of um, organizing that's not being done? I mean, the, there's this futile effort to organize the world's governments and aid organizations and, and so on, um, where something else should be happening? I mean, my honest answer is I think we're in for 100 years of ad hoc responses of, of people after each storm or after each flood or after each heat wave, people looking around and saying, oh, we didn't know that was coming. Um, but that's because I'm a pessimist. Uh, I mean, I think that what we... But, I, but where I see hope is that there is, there is increased discussion. And it's not just about climate change. It's also about terrorism. Um, increased conversation about preparedness, about disaster mitigation, about um, resilience, which I think is a term that is um, has has been denuded been been denuded of its original technical meaning. Um, and I think that we can. I think I hope that we can use that attention, that new attention, that new political. That, and the money and the politics that go along with it to actually, to do real preparedness. And what that real preparedness is going to be is not, and I think this is the really hard thing, is that it's not going to be a technical solution. That disaster relief is very often presented as, an, or disaster prevention is often presented as an engineering problem. Right? It's a, a how do we build a... Um, a storm gate in New York Harbor? How do we build a giant tsunami wall off the coast of Japan? How do we, um, how do we seed clouds to, or whatever it is that people want to do for the various geoengineering projects to prevent global warming? And I think, I mean, I, I think those are all going to be doomed to failure for a variety of reasons. But primarily, but the reason primarily is that disasters are not technical problems. Disasters are political problems and therefore require political solutions. And so I, what I would like to see is this attention to resilience, this attention to climate, hopefully attention to climate change, this attention to terrorism, lead us to build the types of communities that are resilient, that are going to be able to respond to disaster, to disasters well, which is to say, dense social networks, high social capital, organizations that encourage um, and build uh, cultures of solidarity, um, which, which is to say strong unions and other and strong public schools, strong institutions like the one we're in now, right? Th these, these civic institutions, the civic infrastructure that helps people build relationships, that help people build connections, that give people the capacity and the expectation of helping each other. 
And the nice thing about all of that is that even without a disaster, those are the kinds of communities we want to be living in anyway. Right? So even if the disaster that we're preparing for never comes, it's a good thing that we're living in a, it would be better to live in a community with high social capital, dense social networks, and, and unions. Um, so I hope that we can harness this in the next 100 years of increasing disaster, disasters and disaster preparedness to build better communities. I don't think that's going to happen. Other, other questions? We all buy your book? Um, four of you can buy my book because <laughs> I have four copies. Um, <laughs> and others of you can take a little flyer and buy it other places. Um, I, I, I'm going to answer Eric's question about, about Klein and Solnit and give people a chance to think about other things they want to ask me. Um, so Solnit's book came out while I was working on the dissertation, and I thought, ah, oh, damn it. And she actually has a chapter on the Halifax explosion, um, sort of. Um, yeah, and I'm basically, I mean, on this sort of, I, I tend to think, I don't, I don't know that they would necessarily think this. I tend to think that they are very opposed, that, that Klein and Solnit are very opposed. I have my students read um, a chapter of uh, Klein and the Solnit, the Solnit's book, A Paradise Built in Hell, was, was based, was sort of started in an article that she published in Harper's by coincidence, the, the October issue of Harper's after Katrina that had been written before Katrina. So I have them read that Harper's article. I have them read a chapter of Klein. And then I try to get them to argue about it. And they actually don't see that much difference, which, which always really surprises me, because I think they're really different. So, so Solnit's argument, so Klein's argument is, as I said, sort of disasters are this terrible time that weakens society and allow bad people, in her, in her telling it's neoliberal reformers, to come in and dismantle and do what they want to do, just commodify everything, privatize things, et cetera. And Solnit's story is essentially my story of disasters or times in which people come together and there's this exciting spirit of organizing and, and working together and helping each other in solidarity. So I think I see themselves as really I see them as really different. They both have this space. Klein has this space where she says, and there's a space to, to, to fight back. And Solnit and Solnit has this moment of and the state tries to fight and, and push back. This, this solidarity. And I think that's what my students, those are the two things that my students latch on to, to say that they're not that different. Uh, but yeah, I think they're really different, and I'm definitely on Solnit's side. Um, I, think that, I, I think that Klein's framework is wrong. I think that her history of neoliberalism is, actually, I mean, I don't know that much about the history of, of Chile, but like, it seems, her history of neoliberalism seems right. Um, I just don't like that metaphor. Um, and, and crucially, right, the history of the history that she tells of Chilean neoliberalism does not actually rely on a real disaster, right? Like it, it relies on a military coup and then disappearances and torture, but not actually a, a natural disaster. Um, I actually have an article that I'm writing with two other people that I am doing the last round of edits tomorrow morning about the Chilean earthquake in 2010 and how it's, a, again, how it's this moment of contestation and fighting over what is the state going to be and what is nature going to be. And in 2010, um, by coincidence, it the earthquake is like a week before Piñera is scheduled to take office. And so it really is this moment of like, what is a post-Pinochet neoliberal state going to look like? Um, but also then a moment that then encourages organization and it's I think not a coincidence that the Chilean student movement uh, that we've seen for the last five years kind of in inspiringly grew in the same city that was the most affected city of the, of the earthquake. Um, so that sort of answers your question. So Team Solnit is, is, is the answer. Mary. As you were answering that, I was just thinking, um, you comment a little bit on the different work that experience of disaster does compared to anxiety about the possibility of a disaster. Because it, it strikes me that those, those two things could do really different <clears throat> political work. The experience, you talk a lot about the actual experience of disaster, 
Um, and this kind of gets to Dan's question as well about like, well, when does that end? When does that moment end? This moment of opportunity of where we actually build different kinds of relationships with people around us. You know, is, is once that moment ends and you move on to having anxiety about the next disaster, is it that anxiety that does the sort of work that Klein is talking about, not the actual experience? Would you think? Yeah, that's actually a really interesting way of putting it. So I, I was. I teach a disaster studies class. I was teaching it last night. And the chap, what they had read for last for this week was a, um, it's actually just two textbooks from a, socio from a sociology textbook about what do people do in disasters. It's the, and it's, like, it's the one really empirical chapter. And it's what do people do in disasters. And what people do in disasters is help each other. The whole structure of this chapter that they read was Everything that you've seen on TV, everything that you've seen in movies where people panic and people loot and people act like animals, that's not true. They actually help each other. They actually act in really pro-social and rational ways. So I, I walk into the room and I literally say, what, how do people act in disasters? First person holds their hand, raises their hand and says, panic. <laughs> and I sighed. This happens every year, so I, I knew it was coming. But those stories that we are, those popular stories that we're told are so pervasive, are so hard to get over. That I think that's, right, and, and what, they, what they prime us for, right, what, like what those stories prime us for is that the response to disaster that we want is the National Guard. Because people are going to act, people are going to be looting, people are going to be crazy, people are going to be... Uh, murdering and pillaging and raping, all the stuff that we heard after Hurricane Katrina that turned out not to be true. And so we better have the police and the army to protect us. We are terrorism, right? Absolutely. Like the preparedness for the nervousness. Uh, um, it's a really good, I think, good way of putting it. And I think this gets to Jack's question about preparing for the next hundred years of climatological disasters, or of Lac Antique disaster, right? all the sorts of disasters that we're going to have for the next hundred years, and be try, try and how this is about. This isn't go, what, what disaster citizenship isn't going to happen on its own. That sort of we have to enact it, right? Like we have to organize for it, and we have to make our disaster preparedness be the disaster preparedness of building strong communities and dense social networks, not the disaster preparedness of everyone get a gun. Um, and again, that's a political project. Yeah, Dana. Can I ask a question? Um, so the examples that you've used, I feel like examples we've mostly been discussing have been very quick disasters, have been sort of a catastrophic thing that happens very quickly, and then there's all this aftermath. And when I think of disasters, again, from my professional life, I think about infectious diseases, um, but also thinking about climate change disasters, a lot of those are slower. So like climate change can be drought over five, 10 years, you know, which will then affect things more slowly. And I feel, I wonder about the response. I might be different and also might be longer lasting. And what made me think about that is when I think of the HIV epidemic, which really developed over years, the response to that is things that we all see now. A lot of that has had to do with uh, the LGBT movement, um, and it's really revolutionized medical research, it's really revolutionized patient advocacy. I mean, it has had so many long lasting effects that I feel like because the disaster lasted longer, perhaps the effects would last longer. And so as people are asking about climate change in the future, I'm wondering if it's just a different type of paradigm, but still has people working together. And if you wanted to think about that, or if you mostly think about quick types of disasters. I mean, I think I do mostly think about quick kinds of disasters, but I think I think that's a really interesting question. I mean, I think, yes, I think you're right. I, and actually, I am, I am, I kind of like your, your way of thinking, I like your way of thinking that these longer disasters create longer term change. Uh, and I think that 
I think that makes a lot of sense. I think thinking about the epidemia, the thinking of, of epidemics or droughts makes a lot of sense. And change in good ways and bad ways, right? That we see the way droughts create war and, and, um, and sort of geopolitical change. I, I'm also a little bit reluctant to, so one of the, one of the things we talk about in, in disaster studies is the way that we can see dis acute disasters in multiple ways, right? We can see, we can see a, an acute disaster as a brief event that then gets done with, right? So um, Hurricane Sandy made a lot of people homeless. Once they're back in their homes, Hurricane Sandy is over, right? But it also... But, but the other way of looking at it is as sort of a, an exclamation point on a chronic disaster that in, say, New York is a chronic disaster of gentrification, a chronic disaster of indebtedness, that the response to, that the, that the acute disaster maybe worsens or, or perhaps um, shines a light on, but is, is really just sort of one moment. And, theref and therefore, returning to sort of the status quo before the disaster is actually not something we want to do because the status quo before the disaster was pretty disastrous to begin with. And so I, I guess I'm, this is not really an answer, but it's sort of just thinking out loud, that I'm a little bit reluctant to, to draw a clear line between these, these acute disasters and these chronic disasters, because acute disasters are just an element of the chronic disaster that preceded them, and then the chronic disaster that's going to follow them. Um, that doesn't answer your question, but it was so sort of some thoughts. Citizenship that perhaps it wouldn't go back to exactly where the, how bad the chronic disaster was before, but it would be improving. Yeah, or, yeah, I mean, I think, unfortunately, I think more often it's worsening. Um, you may, you may, you may see a theme. You may see a theme of my of my answers. Um, but, but yeah. So can I ask another sure. question? So to move maybe beyond the pessimism, I don't know if this this does or doesn't. I don't know. I don't know if, I don't know if you'd have. I don't even know if you'd have any much. we would want to even talk about this. But one thing that I was thinking about was beyond disaster, thinking about working class organization um, outside of disasters, but thinking of it. Um, in terms of what's possible, thinking of it when the working class is on the offensive. So thinking of, it made me think of like the Seattle general strike of I don't know, 1919, Minneapolis in the 30s. So places where working class people have organized themselves in similar, in maybe similar ways, maybe not, um, to demand things of the state, to, you know, um, but, but they're essentially on the offensive, but it is often in times of, it can often be in times of crisis. Um, and yeah. going on strike is, creates a crisis almost um, of not having a regular income, of you know, all, all sorts of things. But you see these, these amazing examples of people running cities you know, on their own, running laundries and food kitchens, et cetera. So I don't know if, how you see your work relating to that or if you think it, it can be in conversation with that or... Yeah, I think, it, I think like. it certainly can be. I think that there is a, I think this, I can't remember who wrote about this. I, I think I first, I first encountered this idea during the, the late 90s, early 2000s sort of anti-globalization protests. And this, this idea of a moment of sort of liberation that happens when, or that happened when people took over the streets in Seattle or took over the, uh, there was a World Bank protest and like took over the, the, the streets in Washington. Like when, when there were these big protests in the before September 11th, when people started not being able to do it anymore, and they would shut down the street. And then like after, and like while people were battling the cops over by the convention center, there was a sort of free space where people were playing soccer in the streets, right? And it's sort of this moment, this this, <laughs> this brief moment that sort of that's sort of this cross between a. a time and space that's just right to get this sort of, uh, to use sort of Aristide Zolberg's term, this, this moment of madness. And I think that, that disasters can be that. So that I, I quote in, it's sort of a forced quote that I really wanted to use and it doesn't quite work, but I, I have this quote in the conclusion from, um, from Colin Ward, who is a, 
an anarchist, a British anarchist writer, who talks about how uh, society that organizes itself is always in existence like a seed beneath the snow, uh, just waiting for the weight of the state to, to lift off, to, to, to disappear. And, and that disasters can be, like general strikes, can be moments in which that seed beneath the snow has a, when there's a, a this metaphor has run off the trail. <laughs> when, when, uh, when, the seed, when the snow melts, when there's a thaw, and, and, the, and the seed beneath the snow has, a, has an opportunity to blossom. That, I, 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 I reached it, I found it. Um, so yeah, I think there's definitely that, um, that similarity. Um, and there is, and this is something that Solnit writes about, right? Like in the, in the midst of this horror, of this danger of in this fear during a disaster, right? When like people are literally dying, there's also a moment of excitement. She has this chapter where she starts with um, uh, William James, I think, who happened to be in, in San Francisco in the 1904, six, whatever it was, earthquake, and fell out of bed and then writes in his diary about what, it, what an exciting, ecstatic moment it was. And so I think that that's really there. I think then it, it has to be tempered with like the actual deprivation that happens after a disaster, but there's deprivation after, during a general strike too, um, as you said. Um, so yes, I think is the answer, and I think that these are right. These are all moments in which suspend, normality to some extent is suspended. That doesn't mean that all of the structures are gone. That doesn't mean that all of the the oppressions and the inequalities are gone, but that people have an opportunity because normality is suspended even briefly, people have an opportunity to imagine the alternative. Um, and sometimes, as in 1877, the state comes in and crushes that alternative super quickly. And sometimes, as in common ground, it lasts for 10 years. Um, but yeah, so I, I, think, I think that's a really good analogy. Jacob, were there profiteers in these two disasters? Um, and if not, was it because they already had laws against that, or was it because they would have seized the opportunity? Or? Um, were there profiteers? So, I. So, in, in Halifax, in Halifax, because it was the middle of the war, there was already a lot of sort of government regulation of um, of employment of of the market. What you get is a fight between the rebuilding people. The the, the relief commission is also in charge of rebuilding. The relief commission is in, this incredibly powerful government agency. And part of what they do is rebuild. And there's a fight between them, on this case representing the people and the good of the people, against the carpenters and the plumbers and the, this, the building tradesmen who are essentially, who in the name of avoiding profiteering, are forced to give up the overtime and the wage wages that they have won in previous years. Um, I can't think of any, so, so there's this sort of fear of profiteering that then prevents something that we might not call actual profiteering. I can't think of any description of real profiteering. Um, I tell a story about a, um, a, a person, a person named Robert Egan who ran a, a creamery in, or a dairy company, essentially, in Salem, who owned 19 trucks. And he, the day of the fire, he was perfectly happy to let these night, to let people just use these trucks to move stuff. To the militia came and used the trucks. Everyone was perfect. There was no record keeping. There was no sense of requisition. It was just here, use it. I have these vehicles. Have at it. A month later the militia was going and trying to compensate people for 
the trucks that they had requisitioned. And it created a lot of ill will because Egan started complaining that he hadn't gotten enough. And when I, the way I analyze this is when he lent it, there was never any idea that there was going to be payment. He was just lending it because people needed to move their stuff. And he had trucks, and trucks were relatively new, and everyone was sort of figuring out what trucks would mean. And it was only once, it was only later that the, that the possibility of money entered the question. And I come to think of it, there's actually stuff like that in, in Halifax, too, in housing. And I think that's actually a pretty common story, that the, that the story that we imagine of the profiteer happens later. And that in the actual moment of crisis, people are perfectly happy to let someone use their truck and not demand money for it. All right. Well, thank you all very much. This was great. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was really, yeah, that was really great. I really, I really enjoyed it. Thanks. Um, I was, a, you know, not sure exactly what you were going to cover, and so I, I, was I hadn't really had a chance to talk to David because I had a jury duty all the way, and he'd been <laughs> apparently sick. sick. So we were supposed to get together this week, and it didn't happen, and so we were talking, and he's like, you good. <laughs> well, that was great. That was wonderful. I have hey started to read the book. Amazing. Um, I haven't gotten very far, as I think I, I, I tweeted to you, but you can, you can write something. I have to let my kids read it. Uh, Jake, Natalia. Natalia. Either one. I I'll find them. her in Brooklyn if you help me how often are you there. I am there Mondays and Tuesdays. Okay, so I'm generally there on Mondays. That's great. So we should be touch, absolutely yeah. be in touch. I mean, it's really right around the corner. It's, who knew? Good to see you. Thanks, 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 Great to meet you. Great to meet you. Yeah, yeah. Do you want to 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 do
I see it as do you sympathize with the state structures or do you resist the state structures? What they do is decide they're going to be against the state structures. It was great. It was great. It's an interesting, you know, maybe it's not what you're talking about. No, I think that's, that makes a lot of sense. I think that's, I think that's right. I think, right, and that's the danger, right? That's the danger of after this moment of madness has ended. Oh, no, literally. Either you can have, like, and you see this actually in Syria, right? You can have, like, the sort of the, the anarchist Kobani types. No, or if, if you, you have a worse state that comes. Right. That's it's essentially just the mafia. Um, right. It's yeah. 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 And it was interesting. I think that's the only way to. I was also thinking about how you would apply it to school shootings. So, well, that's well, when does a oh, disaster is begin and end, and how do you find yeah. it? I'm sure you go through it in the book. So no, actually, the truth is, the truth is, I don't. The truth is, actually, I really don't. But it's like a classic because you're a historian, right, and not a cultural studies person. But I'm like, hello, Agamben, and state of emergency. I would call it theory monster. So, so I, I, this is actually we talked about in class last night. Like, I think of it as a disaster as a moment that I missed the beginning too, but exceeds the capacity of the of the institution. Yeah, of the pre existing institutions. Hey, thank you for coming. This is a symbol, and I like that. You just took one. Sorry, no. Um, we're, we're all. It might be clear. Um, Kidding. Uh, <laughs> how much does your book cost? $25. Yeah, I'm going to buy a book. Okay. I gave my mom to her. Oh, yeah, I was going to write it. Should I sign it to her? Oh, she really liked that. All right, don't do it. Don't do it. No. Okay. I'll do it in a bit. Okay. Uh, sorry. Uh, that, yeah, so that's, I mean, I think that, that, that's how I would say one of the disasters, like, is whatever that, whatever the institution you're talking about, if it actually is extruded, then it's a disaster. And so if the capacity sort of isn't exceeded, how far into that process right? the capacity to respond to the, of the and not just the institution, but of society, right? Yeah, like, that's 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 great. Brought in. Twenty years. There, there are uh, years I'm three years, years in the sociology here. Like here. I did a master's in like the history. Sociologists are irritating so I mean, in a lot of ways. I do too. I mean, they draft cultural studies people are crazy. You may, you may have, but I've been that. So three years in, I've got. I also like. I'm also a very strange person for starts. But like, there's a and hopefully you don't. But they do a lot of this work, but then like I sort of do environmental history and social history. Yeah, I use some of their integration studies too, but I'm like the very like definitions of models that you're using and you're being teased out, such as like man and woman. You know, again, theoretically, it's like my first chapter of my integration as emergency. How about you? You're in the 1980s, and I look at the Immigration Emergency Powers Act. Well, I didn't know you were a student. It's very emotional. It's like, oh, my God. Like, this is a human being here. There's more humans than we know, and they're bad. Yeah, exactly. So now it's an emergency, and you need to give the president unilateral power, like, you know, like a Nazi Germany, so we can, like, do something about this. And it didn't pass, but that discourse, like, it was. Like, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? This is the flip side of an emergency on one hand, loosens. The state, so get to read the state coffers, right? People respond to each other. On the other hand, also it makes much more money. Like that's now what the whole thing is. The state coffers are open. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're also going to expand to the state. I think that I think that that is what you're pointing to is exactly that. And this is the the reporter who called me or emailed me first. She said like, can we talk about? This disaster, <laughs> like this, a state of, state of emergency, state of disaster for homeless people. And the first thing I assumed was, oh, what that is, is it's like the police coming, declaring an emergency, and dismantling homeless people. Yeah, I was confused. Yeah, and it turns out that's not that. That was like, there's these pockets that were done, you know, like I don't see my shadow. And I think it's like sex workers' rights, too. And I'm like, or even same sex marriage, fighting through rights through the states to me seems like still a limited agenda. It's a privileged fucking position for me to do. Well, and I think, and I hope that's what I'm doing. 
so I'm doing it, I'm trying to see the part of that ambiguity, the irony, the irony and the subversions of that, right? That like, Rita Marisi did not want the state telling her what to do. And like, she's very explicit about that when she has another baby, and, right off, and she tells the midwife, do not tell the Marisi that I am having a baby. And of course, she keeps like a baller. Yeah, she kind of is. Um, it's a great story. We'll be lying to you. Give him the, the end. The last thing in the file is a letter written by yeah. one of the one of the boys with that was the young man, like going off to war. And war. No, you just um, um, it's an amazing story. Uh, anyway, but like she, she knows your Gallatin students. Uh, 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 so who put together the event yes, yes. and works oh. at the uh, right. Like that is totally center for place. Politics. Yes, like she gets what she's doing. I know David from wanting money but not the authority. Mutual friends. The story of Rita Marie Wanting money but not the authority. Mutual friends. The story of academic work. They want support, right? Like they want things. Yeah. Money. They I, don't, I don't know where the story is. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 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 It's not the show. Like, <laughs> like, maybe it's just like. Nails nails. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> I've never seen it actually. Deserving uh, this. Uh, deserving this being racialized. Yeah. So he put this in there. So it's interesting. That's racialized. So the fact that it's not racialized is racialized. That kind of. Sure. Yeah, the yeah, assumed yeah, subject yeah, is white, so that is racial. Yes, sure, that's right. I would agree. Yeah, I'll agree with that. Right. No, me too. Yeah, so, so it's good. Too. It makes oh, me very much. Clearly, very much. And like, feel like yeah. I know some, some women got compensation so for being. I can add it into my orals list. My conversation is good. I can really talk about it. It's deeply sexist. And I can talk about it in relation to You know, it's one of those. Absolutely. Unfortunately, I read some of the things. Literally, I'm doing. I felt uncompensated <laughs> in visible <laughs> households. So right. all of a sudden, can't. Yeah. And that family so, either has to hire someone else to do it, or they have to hold someone, one of the children who has been working, has to hold that person home to do the work. Right? Like, it's 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 this is where you're and it doesn't, and it's not, it's very haphazard, it's, it's very weird, but it is, most people do not get it, but it is there, and people are demanding it, there's this, the, the chat, the host that I, that I call the title, that I call that chapter is, yeah, where it, Someone would have had you would have had to pay someone. To miss so like it's a, someone call the marriage. Yeah, the relief right, would have had, you know, the relief would have had to pay someone. Right? Someone to pay someone. Right? 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 We know I'm missing two stories. Uh, anyway, it's, a, yeah. it's someone who is not yeah, paying attention. It was, it was like, if you, if, if you were, if I had known you weren't going to pay me, I would have stayed at work, made cash, and the relief would have had to pay somebody to take care of my sick mother. I really like. I wish I had done that. And that people, it's kind of amazing. 1917, that people are making a wages for housework. Right out there. It's great food. Yeah. Super people. Yeah. I know. It's a park. Historians are the other side of the Did you just touch your cover? Yes. So you're the other I went back, it's like there was a designer that like, gave me a mock up and I changed and I didn't like the first one and we like, went back. Right. Okay, because they just sent me something. Oh, yeah, you can definitely. Well, I think my artwork was there. The artwork that I wanted was it. I'm on the other side. Yeah. 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 So they were like, what do you want? Wait, Empire State, they give you a million dollars. I didn't ask Empire State, NYU's budget is only. It's like, they're not going to give you a million dollars. Kids are in, they wanted like 10 grand or but they picked Definitely. another image. Definitely. 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 Definitely.
So you've been there a couple of years, years. three years, years longer? Yeah, two years. Yeah. Um, I've got I mean, I had to, I had to pay reproduction. I had to pay for the images in, in the book. So you had to ask Yeah, yeah. Really, because we did fair use for some. Like a picture of David's ass. Fair use. Fair use. The problem is that the, the way <laughs> archives are assholes. The way the archives are saved, like, you, it's not a copyright fee. It's a, you know, you know. And you have to say it. It's going to be, do you remember I did, but I take my index. I take my index. Oh, I know I'm about to pay for it. Are you leaving? Yeah. Say hi to Danielle. Thank you very much for that. I don't want to The menu. Spreadsheet, by the way. That was really helpful. I've got all sorts of other hand recommendations for things to do when you get many. So what we actually were thinking was just like making you give us the list of like your all your vendors and just like recreating. We're going to do it in Asian Park. But um, but like get your tents, get your chairs, get your table cloth. I would like to take off this article. Thank you. So much. Thank you. And am I going to like see you again? Oh, yeah. 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 Okay. You're still going? <laughs> <laughs> Where are you going, weirdo? I think you can have to take some. So what? <laughs> Yeah. Making it's very, weird. it's weird though. Yeah, like, I'm like, I have to like sit down in there with like a plan. Was it, was it weird? Yeah. Implementing gender equality. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah. Great to meet you. Great to meet you. So I'll email you, <laughs> do me to email you about getting on that list? Yes, I would love that. I'll just CC the person you're Yeah, meeting. that'd be great. I would love to be on that list. And um, we've got something coming up in the spring, but otherwise there's two more in the fall. Yeah, I mean, I've got nothing to present for a while. Oh yeah, no, I mean, there's no, I mean, no but I'd love to go. Yeah. Good. I would love to go. And good to see you. Thank you for coming. Yeah, it would be great to have more people. We're always, we have a huge list, but the people have been coming out. It has been smaller, and so we're always as, as it happens. Yeah, well, that'll be good. Yeah, and good. I'm going to be in the environment. I'll turn my. I want to hear about the two sides. So we'll, yes, yeah. stay in touch. Good. Okay. Good. And good luck with the uh, jury duty. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Thanks. Are you from the yeah. I went to Wilson. So also I was thinking, yes. listening to you, that especially this whole conversation about who deserves something after the past, if there's any literature you found about sympathy as a resource, right? Like, in a way, that's what it is, right? Yeah. These people deserve sympathy. And then after a while, they don't anymore, right? We've run out of that resource. Whereas these other people, don't these new people, them. these new people deserve. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. People yeah. talk about the. Um, is there, is there a for that? That? Oh my gosh! What do people call it? They call it. Um, <laughs> sympathy fatigue. Yeah. Uh, don't know if it was yeah. something like that. So yes, I mean I don't talk about it, but which yeah. means and I haven't really read it, but yes, it exists. Yeah. Hey, look at. Uh, but really, <laughs> the, probably the place to look is is Michelle Dauber's book, which is a, it's a little bit of a weird book. She's a she is a lawyer and she is at Stanford Law School, but like this is a who was built out of her sociology dissertation, but it's also a history book. It's kind of a strange book in that way, but. It's, it's very much about how you construct sympathy yeah, for this new type of disaster, mm -hmm. yeah. um, which is yeah. which is a good yeah. I mean, it's, it's definitely something that like <laughs> international <laughs> fundraisers, like humanitarian mm -hmm. yes. types, talk about. Well, um, which and they definitely talk about it, and they talk about it a lot, and like it's just not really nice. But yes, yes is the answer. Yeah. Watching uh, you die from the like, I know, you must be exhausted. I'm exhausted. Do you want it? Yes, take it. Take it. I'm going to see if I have. Um, so I do have chain. I do have five. So if you have. Look at that. Look at that. That was meant to be. It's for sure. Yes, it is. What a great, what a great oh, talk. Thank you. I don't know if I've ever listened to a friend of mine do a reading of the book. Oh. Right. Does she spell Debbie the normal way? D E B E I E. Yes. But when I was across the street, I saw this happen. That's fair. And she's going to be very pleased. I sort of looked and then I thought, I need to go check and see if that guy's okay. And myself and about six other people. It's weird for me to write the name Debbie since that's my mother's name, but I don't call her Debbie. It's just like a weird. Well, it could be worse. You could have married my wife, or her mom's 
also named Debbie, He's and they have the same birthday. That seems very convenient. You can just like buy the same card, and yeah. except it's a little weird. So Debbie and Holly. We'll, Thank you. We'll See spend, you later. We'll tend to spend birthdays with her because we're here in New York. And she's like, what about Debbie on her birthday? Like, no, no, wait, you're Debbie on your birthday. <laughs> but this time I'm going to DC next week for. Oh, that's nice. Good for you. No, I'm going for Department of Energy, but I'm going to go. We're going to see her on the Wait, and it's her birthday next week? Yes, you said her birthday is St. Patrick's Day. That's very weird. And my mom's best friend growing up was also named Debbie. It's a little disconcerting. It's a generational thing. It is definitely. Wonderful. Thank you. 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 Like, where people would never ever talk under right. any circumstances. And I was thinking, like, when did that moment, that small scale, you know, and then I was like, okay, I didn't tell you, somebody got hit by a car oh on the intersection where I'm convinced I'm going to die. And he was, okay, his knee was, in, was injured in some way. But it was, um, you know, the, the heroin addict, she looks like a little girl. Blonde hair, looks like a pixie. Yeah. I like. I would want to cry when I see her. So she was there, handing with the guy that she's always with, and she came running over. And I actually walked over there because I heard her yelling, and I recognized her voice. Oh, she wasn't. Her she, voice. she wasn't hit. No, she was no, the, it was the, some the, some poor guy. Right, right, right. right. Yes, yeah, so right. all these just right. pulled together. I think these as New York moments after the crazy person leaves the train. <laughs> yeah, that today I'm on the bus. I'm gonna start smashing like the window of the bus. Oh, and I was like, oh my gosh, shoot. What's going on? Inside or outside? It was like, he'd been on the bus and everyone seemed totally normal. And then when he got, got out, off the bus, he got off the, the bus and started slamming on the outside of the bus and yelling. We were like, all right, dude, whatever. <laughs> but as you said, very classic New York. I'm like, come look, see John. Yeah, exactly. like, and then gets back to what they're doing. Yeah, we're now going to acknowledge that there are other people here. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, but your point was that, that it probably Yeah, but I was saying that like when did that moment end then? Right. Like, at some point it was like I have to catch a train. Right. You know, yeah. we're sort of standing around and all of a sudden it becomes a little awkward. <laughs> and yeah. so once I'm, I'm yeah. Explaining. Yeah. So once the once the fireman got there, right? Yeah, like, once oh, you're no yeah, longer needed essentially. Yeah. That's really cool. Thank you. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Thank yeah. you. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, that was fun. I didn't know you two were coming. I didn't know either. Yeah, we did. Good nice surprise. Advice. Well, I was the, the first one, which okay. I originally harbored some illusions of going to, we were flying, we were on a plane back from uh, Spain that morning huh. that landed like an hour before. The pleasure trip to Spain. Yes, uh, yes. Well, a work trip to London all over mm. the weekend. I, I try to make the most of my work trips. Well, as you should. I can't always, but um, and I just had these, you know, illusions that we would, you know, either go straight from the airport yeah, yeah, yeah. or get home and be like, okay, just spent all day sleeping on the plane, feel good, let's turn around and like go out this thing. That, that is overly optimistic. Neither of those things happened. Um, Excuse me, one, I was feeling very sick, and then also we got home and the door to our terrace oh, yeah. was outside in the terrace. What? what? Yes, it had been ripped off its hinges. By the wind. It was kind of fun. What? Luckily, the top hinge still held it, so the door didn't actually shatter, so we were really lucky. But yeah, we literally walked in, and Sam was like, what? Because, <laughs> like, it was just open to the outside. It's a good thing you live so high up. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. It was, not, it was not a safety issue, we, but, like, the whole... I think the living high up was responsible. For why we were yes. doing that. But on the other hand... Right. But on the other hand... Bending over. It's like, it's it's good thing you were on the... Exactly. exactly. Good thing you were on the second floor. Exactly. <laughs> My gosh. Yeah, no, it was pretty impressive. It was pretty cool. That's impressive wind to blow open a door and, and off its hinges. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think if it's not closed. So you like forgot to close the door before. No, 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 but like if it's closed. If that's all the so way So it's very heavy, yeah. right? And like it can easily be closed and you think it's latched and it's not. Because right. it's so that's what you assume it happens. Right. And once it starts to come open. Then it can blow it open. Blow open. And yeah. once it's so heavy that if the wind is like blowing it, I think it's yeah, it makes sense. The guy was like, oh yeah, that happened in, in Sandy too when we were over there. Yeah. yeah. So you knew it was last time. Well, well, we weren't there when they right, fixed right, it. They were like, oh, that happened last time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Oh, well, they somehow fixed it the next day. Right? Yeah, anyway, so we didn't make it to the next one, and then we did immediately plan to come to this one, and we just didn't. Well, because it was a surprise. Well, I didn't go to the last one. Jenny, so. did, I assume there were two of the people who told you that. Yes, we did. Yeah. 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 Do you have any more of your books, or did you sell them? No, yeah, you, books? Books? Yes. you can you yes. can get him a book. Yeah. You get two. All right. It's actually kind of a few. Okay, okay, we drive out of No, 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 no. no. I, I, you are welcome to this. Okay. If you'd rather yeah. have us go and buy no, no, no. a bookstore, we can do that too. Yeah. Okay. Okay. No. I mean, unless. Yeah, yeah, no, 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 no I, I have no reference. I mean, I suppose if you were going to go to like book court and ha and be like the people off the street, be, I'm really interested in this book. Please order it because then they might like have have extra copies and they would put it on their shelves. If you're gonna buy it from Amazon, you might as well buy it from me. <laughs> you and you'll get and you'll get a, and you'll get a discount. Yeah, so. we probably buy it. All right. All right. All right. We don't live that close to book court. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Anyway. We do like book court. That's what, that's what I figured. Yeah, like yeah. that's what I figured. If I were buying it, I would buy it off Amazon or whatever, right. not right. go to the store. So, yes. So oh, cool. this is this is good. I haven't seen you all since the beginning. I've never seen you. Oh. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. Congratulations. Best wishes. Oh. You're here. Yeah. Uh, will you be at your mission? Sure. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know if I'm supposed to make that like more. Uh, no. We're just to get down one knee. Yeah, no, no. <laughs> Great. I haven't seen you. I will. will you be at your mission? <laughs> be honored to be at your mission. That was way more formal than I asked my bridal party to. <laughs> I was like, like, okay, I'll ask an email ask because I kept oh, trying September to schedule a conversation with her, but she isn't joking. It's the Sunday of Labor Day. Of next year. Of this year. This year. Six, six months. And if you decide to go Sunday. Yes. Yes. Um, Edgerton Park Conservancy in New Haven. This is why I, okay. I, I, have to date it. I have to. I like this. You said Edgerton. Yeah. Edgerton. Edgerton Park. Where is it? The border up, up Whitney, uh, the border between New Haven and New Haven. It looks out over East Rock. Okay. It has pretty greenhouses. Did you, did you ever go to the Folk Festival? So I went to Hamlet was. So we're quite biased towards the Sunday of Labor Day as a wedding choice. All oh, right, that's when you got married. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, oh, I feel like right. it's pretty standard. That's why I was saying. I thought you were saying that there was someone else that you were No, 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 no. 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 It's like, same thing. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Not yeah. the same calendar. Well, and the same. thing is, we really should have sent out save the dates much earlier. Because it probably but, there are people who aren't going to be able to come yeah, because, they're because of that. Ways. But the thing was, so we, a couple months ago, called the Edgerton Park people, got penciled in, and then I promptly got this job offer that made us think that we were going to move to Maryland. And is it in Hampton, Connecticut, or is it in New York? It's right on the border. So it's 75 Cliff Street in Hampton, Connecticut? I could believe that, yes. Could be. It's like Hampton, DEM, right? H-I-M-D-E-M. Yes, yeah. Hampton. Yeah. You're right, you're right. It's Hampton. Yes. Cool. Anyway, at that point, we Neither were put the place sure we were in your calendar. And so we did not send it. We did not yes. tell anyone about the date or anything because we, we thought that the date would have to change. And now, <laughs> now we have to double check that we are still on the calendar of the park. And What's on my calendar? Yes. So, so it's <laughs> on my calendar. I think we will find another place. Yeah. If the same day, if yeah. we are now, somehow pushed out of the park. Now that we know that we're going to be in the New York, New Haven area, then yeah. it's just it's so. It's so crazy and so expensive yeah. to do a wedding in New York that we 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 looked very yeah, we looked briefly too, briefly and we were like, yeah. it's crazy. Like, we were overwhelmed. You would have to have a really good reason, or you would yeah. do something really small. Yes. Yeah. Well, yeah. that's the thing. So right. I thought I want to get married in Prospect Park. Like we used to go to yeah. picnics there all the time. It was so nice. It was so beautiful. So nice. so nice. so and it's crazy. I mean, the the site fee. Is one thing. The site fee, we could have like sucked it up. Okay, it's the wedding. It's where we want to do it. But then they restrict your caterers for a brunch wedding. There was nothing under one hundred and sixty dollars a head for a brunch wedding, oh, and this was before the brunch. alcohol. Wow. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Because that you're a lot. You're restricted to a yeah. list of brunch. five yeah. caterers. How like, did you? How did you hire yourself? Gold. Gold legs. Exactly. 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 And so, like, I contacted like, three of the five caterers on the list, <laughs> and then I was like, I, I keep, hey, there's no way we can do this. And so, Hi. Hi. Heather, are you not finished? We are finished. Do you have the space? I'm not taking 
Oh, oh yes, take the equipment. Like Thank you. Did you guys have plans? No, we, we, were, we were talking about we were talking about going to Korean food, but we could be flexible. Probably. Good for you in this location. That it's probably the only good thing to do in this location. That is kind of. Oh, that's an excellent idea. Let's do that. Oh, but in you know what else we are now, as of today, or as of a few days ago? What? Members of the Yale Club. Ah. Mary, yes. Mary joins. I didn't think I was a member yet. And you were like, no, you're an active member. I was like, oh, okay. No, we won't do So maybe one day we can, enter, we can entertain you in the, the L Club. But you can't wear jeans. Yes, but you can't wear jeans. Except for in the room.